Okay, thanks for having me here. I'm excited to um, talk to you a little bit today. So I decided to take my angle a little bit around ideas, innovation, and execution, uh, which I think are three concepts that go together that really make a successful entrepreneur. Um, as a little bit of background, though, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about where I spent my last couple of years, um, just because some of it's fun, and it kind of lays context for some of the things I have been working on. Um, we have the op So as mentioned, for the last three years, I've been working in the 3D printing space. We decided to create a platform where we could create personalized products. So 3D printing is perfect for, um, you know, if I need 10,000 of it, I'm still going over to Asia. But if I need one that's unique and that I can figure out how to make many of, 3D printing is really interesting. So we decided to create a platform where we would create personalized product. If you want to become Iron Man, then you use our product. So we created software that takes a high-res capture of a face and literally lets you become Iron Man all of the way through the process. Um, in addition to that, we've created lots of really cool products. We got to go to the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago, and we sold product both in stadium. Um, and who knows who Thomas Davis is? OK, who is he? He's a linebacker for the Panthers. OK, so he's a linebacker for the Panthers. And what happened to him? He broke his arm. OK, broke his arm in the championship game two weeks before the Super Bowl. If you look at any of the photos, right, they'd cut his arm open and put 12 pins in it. Well, after that happened, of course, if you're him, you're going to play in the Super Bowl, right? It's kind of, you never know if you get this opportunity again, except for they probably will. Um, but if you follow Cam around, you might. Um, the, what was interesting, though, is he wanted to play in the Super Bowl. And creating a brace is a really hard problem that is both strong enough to withstand, he's a lineman, right? Strong enough to withstand any of the force that would come at him and protect his incision with the 12 pins. And so they basically went out to 3D printing to see if they could do it. I brought one of the ones that actually broke. This isn't the exact one he wore. It's still at the, one of the replica is still at the office. But we actually 3D printed the brace that he wore in the game um, at our company. And the coolest part about it was that the 3D printer, well, this one is why he didn't wear this one. Um, it was a different material. But the coolest part about it was is with 3D printing, we could print a brace that was both hard rubber and soft rubber at the same time. So the brace that he wore looks exactly like this. It has his number in the front of it. And the material inside of it was squishy, and the outside was a little bit harder, so that it could both protect him from the force and protect his arm from actually getting hurt. It was the first time 3D printing had ever been on that big of a stage. Um, we did it. We, the print took about 33 hours. And it went from us getting a scan of his arm to actually with him at training in about three days, which is pretty amazing. Um, and that's the cool stuff that things like 3D printing enables. Now, in my, um, in my company that I built, we had the opportunity to work with all of the biggest brands um, in the world creating this platform. So we started working with Marvel we were, and Star Wars and all of those properties to create 3D products. So you can find them in Targets if you're in California, and in Toys R Us, and on all sorts of channels. Um, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of the things that I learned along the way prior to starting my 3D printing company. Um, and I did a bunch of fundraising rounds and then just recently sold it, um, is I spent four years as an entrepreneur in residence at Disney in Imagineering. And um, it was a really cool experience. My entire background, as mentioned, is in technology. So I've been all about building product um, and building product that meets the demands of users and drives customer acquisition. That's the thing I care a lot about. How do people use your product? Uh, why will they use your product? And what's interesting about that? And so I got this opportunity. And at Disney, um, under Imagineering, we had to serve all the business units. So we did stuff with ESPN. We did stuff with studios, interactive, theme parks, international. You name the division. Um, and my job was all around technology commercialization. So the innovation that was coming out of the academic research arms that we have with Carnegie Mellon and ETH, which is the MIT of Switzerland, and Harvard and MIT, we would figure out if we could make products out of those and what that product would look like. I was actually the very first EIR ever hired in at Disney, and it was a big experiment. So we didn't know exactly what it would look like or where it would go. But I figured I couldn't pass up the opportunity to go work there as I was coming off one of my startups. And so I'm going to share a little bit with you about some of the products and some of the things that I learned along the way, in addition to some of my other um, thoughts as we go through this. OK, so I wanted to share with you, and hopefully it's still teed up. Um, uh, let's see, switch my slide.
Okay, so who wants one of those? Right? I'm like, I want one of those, right? What, so, you know, what, it's a really cool video. Actually, I got exposed to it because um, uh, I teach for the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. And um, as we talk about ideas and blue sky and creative thinking, this was one of the videos we started showing this year. And what's really, what I, what I think, it, what I, when I look at this, it's a really cool innovation. And you watch it and you're like, I need one of those. But what's so cool about it is how many people in the world do you think of have thought of flying cars? A lot of people have thought of flying cars, right? These guys were not the first people to think of flying cars. But what they were were some of the first people to start executing on that idea. And I think that that's the key to successful entrepreneurship, and that's the key to building successful companies and doing successful projects. It doesn't lie just in the idea alone. Um, and my reason for saying that is because there are lots and lots of ideas. I promise you, in this world, there is no shortage of ideas. Anything that you can imagine, someone else has most likely thought of. Because that's how the world is. We have so much creativity and so many opportunities to think of really cool ideas that it's really hard to find one that someone else hasn't thought of along the way. Um, and I think, if you remember that, that as you're building companies or you're coming up with ideas, that the success of an idea isn't laying in just the idea. It's, laid, it's actually in the foundation of your ability to actually do something with the idea. Um, because there's lots of ideas that no one ever does anything about, right? Every one of us has something where we're like, hey, I totally should have done that, and then someone else comes out and invents that. And so where I want to take you is that it's about, two thi about three things. It's about the combination of ideas and innovation and ultimately execution. So one of the ways that we start pushing ideas, so I'm going to walk you through each of those kind of as separate thoughts. Um, on the idea side, so we use this interesting framework when we're, when we're talking about how do you actually start to think bigger than just a really easy idea. And so we, we've kind of separated ideas into these types of things. So as an example, um, actually, they came out of BYU. Who's familiar with the, the Kistix company? Has Dallas been here? OK, so what is Kistix? I cannot hear you. Chapstick. Chapstick, and there's two flavors. And when you kiss, it makes a different flavor. Right, this is the idea, OK? This company came out of BYU. Now, let's pretend that um, Kistix was our, see, it's entertaining, um, that Kistix was our company, and we were taking this product to market. What would we normally do to take that product to market? We would come up with some ideas where we're like, oh, who's going to buy that product? It's an impulse buy. This is what we would eventually think, right? You're going to buy this product when you're checking out of some store. So our distribution strategy would be really normal. We would say things like, OK, I've got this really great idea. Let's go put it you know, in all of the grocery stores when you're checking out. Let's let you buy it, because that's the time people are going to purchase it. We don't actually want it on any chapstick aisle, because that's not when people make that purchase. Um, and we would go and find all of those people. And we would come up with an entire business plan, all of us, that would be, where make total sense, where we're like, OK, that's our demographic. Those are the people who are going to buy it. This is how they access it. And we would get them to purchase it. So we call all of those ideas that we would all just generally think of kind of in this grounded idea category of a business. They're safe. They're predictable. They're known. Right? We know how to go build this business plan. We know how to call. This is exactly what Kistix did. Right? They know how to call Walmart. They know how to call Associated Foods. They know how to go get into this distribution channel. But the interesting thing that happens to our businesses is when we start to think bigger. Now, at Disney, we actually had a group called the Blue Sky Group. And their entire job every day was to think about you know, how you push ideas and how you make them bigger and how they're not just the individual thing in there. So Blue Sky, and in this, I'm going to even go to Spaced Out. So in Blue Sky, we start thinking bigger. We're forward looking. Um, we're unique. We're, ex you know, we're exciting. We're unexpected. How many of you have been to Walt Disney World with the Magic Bands? OK, well, everyone should go to Walt Disney World with the magic bands. OK, and I'll talk about them in a little bit. But it was an idea that started in a blue sky. And every year in Disney, um, there's entire blue sky sessions that are specifically focused on the what ifs. Like, what would happen if the guests could do this in the park? What would happen if we could analyze data this way or provide this type of information? And so you're trying to push the limits on what would be normal. Now, if we go back to our Kistics friends, this was back before everyone knew about Shark Tank and everyone wanted to be on Shark Tank, and it was a marketing effort. Um, they actually were one in one of the first series on Shark Tank, and Mark Cuban funded them in the very, very early days. 
Um, and so if you start thinking, because now you guys all know it and we even have competitions here and people trying to get to um, Shark Tank, but in the days when no one knew about them, they were really pushing the limits of their business because they looked at it and they said, hey, we can do all of these grounded things. We've now got these deals coming where we're doing tests in some of big mass market channels. How do we move up? So they went on Shark Tank and that started to totally change the landscape for them. And then over time, Mark Cuban pushed them to even think further. So Mark Cuban actually bought and owned the URL howtokiss.com. Do you think that's a popular URL? It's a really popular URL. Um, actually, one of the most popular URLs outside of some other ones. So people search on how to kiss. And what domain shows up? Howtokiss.com. Right? And so all of a sudden, you think of these guys who started down here making chapstick. And now all of a sudden, the company owns howtokiss.com. Um, and at the time, a couple of years ago, going into like Valentine's Day, um, they ended up becoming a more of a content and an ad company because people like Hallmark took over full ads for Valentine's Day, right? And they started pushing the company in other directions. Well, it's an interesting story because it shows how one business who starts making chapstick and how we thought of as just taking it into a normal channel can have all sorts of other business opportunities when we start not being limited by the constraints of our own ideas. And I really think, I think of ideas that way, that you know, it's our job not just to come up with them, but to figure out how do we push the limits, how do we get more imaginative. Um, and it, when, we, when I teach people in the growth planning session on the Goldman Sachs, we always talk about spaced out. Like, what are the ideas you can think about that people would laugh at you out of the room? How do they laugh you out of the room? Because when you've hit that point, then you start being really creative about ways that you can solve your problem and successes that you can have that other people haven't started thinking about. Because it is true, your idea already exists, but it is about the combination of your skills on execution and your skills on creativity that tend to push us even further in what might be possible. Um, so, let me, so I'm gonna bridge that into innovation for a little bit. So the World of Congress recently had their, um, the World of Congress, the Young World of Congress, and they talked about the fact that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. And the fourth industrial revolution is entirely about this next wave, wave of innovation. So the third was all about bringing everything online, which we've been in roughly for the last 30 years. Now what they're talking about is this, in, this thing where it's digital and cyber meets each other, right? and digital and physical. So 3D printing happens to be in there, and so is the Internet of Things. Um, and the Internet of Things basically means, and it's very much even today, that everything that we own becomes connected. Right? There's some way that it's connected, there's some way that it knows and has identity, it knows location information, there's things that allow it to become connected. So innovation is a really big part of where we're headed today. And you're seeing not only in things, so we're gonna see this entirely really cool next generation of devices and of the internet. Everything you own from your bicycle to your car to every device in your house will eventually have some connectivity. And we've seen early days of that, right? Whether you're wearing your Fitbit or I'm wearing my iWatch or um, we're talking about you know, tags we're putting on specific things or even in the gaming industry, interesting things like Skylanders and Disney Infinity that have RFID chips in them. We're already enabling different types of play where these two worlds meet. And that's gonna continue to happen. And so, and I want, so there, but there's other innovation that's not just the, the Internet of Things that is starting to drive really interesting user behavior. So innovation, right, at the core of it is our ability to see something new, a different business process, a different way to approach a market, and even at the core of it, a different product. So this is one of my favorite examples of an interesting innovation over the last 20 years. So for the first time, a year and a half ago, first time in 20 years, software drink sales increased for Coca-Cola. First time in 20 years, that's amazing, right? And why did it, why did it? Because people, in the, in, they understood that if I can take innovation and relate it directly to people, that I can drive more product sales. So what this campaign did is it took all of our favorite names and it drove our relationship with the brand tighter. So what the Internet of Things does is exactly that, is I become in tighter control of the identity of my products. They more closely represent me, my behaviors, and my buying patterns. And we're seeing that at the very beginning with all sorts of other really cool things. So I also use this slide um, as one of the backdrops to my 3D printing business, where personalization meets mass market, where for the first time I can individualize my product for you and I can get you to buy it based off of an emotional draw and an association that you have. 
it's pretty staggering to think that the first time in 20 years, because the energy drinks and the water drinks have taken over the drink world, right? So this is an entire new way to start thinking. And everyone knows soft drinks are bad, so I'm happy that they increased because I'm a Diet Coke fan. Um, just as an example, that premise of that innovation is one of the things that has really driven my world. So in my world, we care, we watch trends like American Girl Doll. I know you're all familiar with American Girl Doll. American Girl Doll, right, is a doll line that Mattel owns uh, that really is the premier doll line in the world. So the doll costs you $120. Right? The outfits cost you $40. Right? She's, you can go to the store in New York City and you can have tea and go to the salon and get your doll's ears pierced and it's an entire experience. But what they've done so well is made those girls feel like that doll represents them. They introduced a, a product line of 40 different variations and you can buy a doll that looks like your daughter. And it's just part of this wave of brands recognizing that the closer you are to their brand, the more they can engage you in that content and drive sales. And it's a really big driver for those companies. Um, you, you've seen it across the board in every product category. It's the reason Under Armour licenses superheroes, because everyone wants to be a superhero, right? Or they want to be part of, yeah, you know, they want to be a Jedi Knight, or they want to be part of their favorite stories. And so what you're seeing is a lot of this happen there. Other things that are driving new waves of innovation, and you live in this world um, every day, Right, is that our smartphones have taken over our world, which means how we think of innovation and how we bring people to our products has really changed. Um, millennials touch their smartphones 45 times a day. Um, many of you probably do it more. I would fall in the more than that category also. Um, five out of six, you connect with your companies on your device. You're sharing information with companies, right? We have an entire different way that the world is starting to communicate. Um, and it's with us on our devices all of the time. Um, and, you know, related to that, I often talk, so the average person only uses seven mobile apps a day. So if I'm building a mobile app, my actual biggest hurdle is becoming one of the seven that someone will get to every day. That's your hardest problem. Well, that and getting early adoption. Um, then, you know, and so if we look at some other stats, and the reason I put these stats up here is because I think it's really interesting to understand the landscape that we live in that is the world that you have to innovate in. Right? And your ideas have to play and have to evolve a next stage of engagement in these types of categories. Um, it is actually true that there are more millennials in the workforce now than there are of any other division. So baby boomers, Gen Xers, the millennials exist, are, are, are the labor force that will change the next world. And it also requires to do different things inside of companies. Um, it is also true that they all use their devices all of the time. They expect you expect different work styles, you expect different ways to engage with companies, you care less about privacy. All of those things become a really complicated background for how we have to actually figure out um, products and innovation and take things to market. Um, and so if you lay the backdrop of all of this innovation and all of the things that are going to become possible, and then you combine it with what I think is the most important step, which is execution. So I'm going to give you my kind of words of wisdom on how you execute companies and what I've learned. So the number one thing I've learned is that teams win and ideas don't. Um, I believe that anything in the world that becomes ultimately successful in general, there's a very, very few exceptions, have really amazing teams that work together to deliver really powerful products. I have been in the situation where I have had good teams and I have had bad teams. And there is a monumental difference between the ability for those teams to deliver. Um, because I don't have the power, even if I have great ideas, I don't by myself, I can't deliver and solve every problem and create everything that might possibly come. Right? Our team is better when there's other people with other perspectives who are all trying to meet the same objective and for us to actually go after that. And so I believe that you know, so I was in one of my recent startups. I had a co-founder, um, and we were never on the same page. Like, so I didn't figure it out before I started the company, but shortly after. And ultimately, it led to lots of wasted cycles inside of the company. Because your emotions, your ability to execute, they all get tied up in people who aren't working well for the team. And that's a really, really frustrating place to be. Because it means that instead of focusing on growing your business, you're focusing on a person. And so I really believe that you need great people with the same focus and the same incentive in order to build great products. 
I've had the opportunity over three of my startups to work with um, the same person. He and I have crossed paths many times. Um, he happens to be a really smart guy. He did his PhD in computational biophysics from Harvard. Um, he is literally one of the smartest people I know. But Tom and I work really, really well together. And whenever I go to start a company and I can leverage his skill set, the combination of those is really, really, it, it's really successful. We know how to work well together, we know how to execute, and the, up, the opposite thing has happened many times for me when I've had bad co-founders. And in, when you get in the situation where you're not working with the right team, you have to change it immediately, no matter how painful it will be. Like if you find yourself every day like, do I actually have to work with that person? Do I have to talk to them? What do I do next? It's way better to just move on than actually try to solve it. You might be individually great at other things, but together, if you're not able to work, it will, you cannot create a winning company with people who don't work well together. It's not possible. It becomes toxic to your company way too fast. So related to that, let's pretend we have a really great team. I want to talk to you about, because product is kind of my passion, some of the things I've learned about making really good product. So I'm going to give you my four things that I tie really closely to execution. And this has really become my mantra for how I build product and companies, which is, first and foremost, that building product is about a story. Um, so most people in my industry, when they started 3D printing companies, decided that they would go sell 3D printing as a technology, because it's a really cool new technology that's changing the way that the world and companies are executing. But the problem is no one actually cares to buy 3D printing for 3D printing's sake. Right? What people want to do is be able to connect with the product that they're doing, and you're trying to solve a problem that specifically ties into what they care about. Disney is probably the master at that, and I learned this a lot while I was working with Disney. There was a project I was working on with Imagineering around Star Wars, and we were taking it into Hollywood Studios in one of the theme parks. And I remember sitting down with Imagineering, and it was in my very early days of working with them, and the Imagineer who came in, who was over our project, it, he, we kind of dove, we had to dive all the way into the story because for them it wasn't just about a tech experience that we were putting. It was really tied into like, well, why would user, why do our guests want to engage with this? Like, what's the story and how does it make sense, right? Like, if we want to make you, at the beginning, we actually wanted to make you frozen in carbonite, like Han Solo. And so the very first time we did it, it was on a sound stage and it became exactly the carbon freezing chamber from the movie. And we had to learn things and make sure the story followed because if you didn't know, right, Han Solo was the first experiment in carbon freezing. But, it therefore, but after that, it became the way people were punished. So if you didn't follow the laws of the land, your punishment was actually being frozen in carbonite. And that's what they did with all those characters. And there was a big hall where they hung on the walls to serve their sentences. So we started learning all about the story. And at first you think about it just as a story, but it's actually not. It's deeply rooted in not only the, the story, but the way people buy product and engage with the brand. People who are fans of Star Wars actually know that folklore. They understand the story. And when you broke story, if you chose to, then people also choose to not stay as engaged with that storyline and ultimately buy the merchandise, which is a really interesting side effect. So if you watch the best storytellers in the world, like Disney, you will see that their stories keep a very authentic line. And any product they introduce, anything they license, anything they do internally follows the story. And they do it because it drives more revenue and keeps you around longer. Star Wars has done a phenomenal job in the last few years of re-engaging a community. Actually, they've done a phenomenal job over 40 years, whether you liked the three movies that came out 20 years ago or not. Um, they've done a very good job of keeping that brand through generations and driving $7 billion of merchandise sales this holiday season. Right? That is a crazy amount of money, and it's all driven because they appreciated story and their community of people who love those brands. So I learned early on when starting 3D Plus Me that I could be any sales deal that comes against me if I follow the story. So I'll sit in a sales meeting with any of the biggest brands, and we'll talk about the product, and I'll say things like, I don't actually think we can build that product. Like, it won't make sense to our customers or to your guests. Right? That they won't buy that product because it's not in line with how they expect to experience your brand. But then we'll invent new ways that you might be willing to experience it. And two things have become the key to us winning all of those deals. It's the only way we landed all of those deals. 
um, is because we understood story and we understood limitations of the technology and we could craft a product that met both. So we could go to them and say, do you know what? Yep, three printing's new. It can't do this, but it can do this, and it would be better served here. And we can go after a market this way, and it's going to be an experiment. But story is the way that we won every one of those deals, because every one of my competitors pitched 3D printing. And you cannot close a deal on 3D printing. It's not possible. So going into... <laughs> Another, I'm not going to show you the whole video. You can see it later. It's online. Um, but you'd be, it was a very much, very emotional experience. And it's been in the parks for four years, all tied to Star Wars weekends and super successful. Um, but the second point I want to drive through is that your guests are in the story. So one of the things to remember is when you're selling and building products that people must purchase is that they actually have to want to purchase them. Right? Most of the things people buy are not things they critically need. Right? You know how to buy your food, and you know how to buy shelter and basic clothing. But we spend a lot of money in today's world on things we don't actually need, but we really want. And the way that we get people to use our products is to understand how they are a key participant in the story that we're trying to sell them, and the reasons, the compelling reasons why they're purchased. Um, I have an entire other topic that. Uh, presentation that I'm not going to give to you today on how I think you have to drive user acquisition inside of products. But what I believe is that and know is that if you make your guests their, the story, if you make them part of the reason, the thing that they're selling, and they understand that, that they will purchase. Uh, stop recording. How many of you have been to World of Color? Because no one's been to Disney World. OK. World of Color. Um, what happens at World of Color? Don't all speak at once. Yeah, projects onto the water, right? So it's a nighttime spectacular that uses fire and water and lasers. And the screen that they project the video on is actually water, right? And it's a really amazing nighttime spectacular. So a couple of years ago, we decided that it would be really cool if not only when you come to a theme park, did you experience a theme park, but you were actually part of the nighttime show. And so we came up with a way with these Mickey ear hats where if you wear them at any nighttime spectacular in almost any one of the parks, for sure in the States and some in the world, that you actually become part of the show. So there's all this programmed infrastructure and you wear these hats. And this was the opening night when it opened with Cars Land. And it was an amazingly compelling experience to be there. So there were 3,000 people in the audience, all with their Mickey ears that lit up. And they literally got transformed to not just be a, an observer, but to be an active participant. And it changed their dynamic of engagement. I remember sitting, I was there that night, we were sitting on the bridge and watching, and some of the reporters next to me, like it was an, it was an interesting emotional experience. Like you felt that experience when you were watching it because all of a sudden everyone there was having the same experience. And what does that do? It drives the, the reasons that they love the park more. It drives their ability to come back. It drives their need for more merchandise and more memories with their families. And those are ultimately the things that those brands are about. And if your brand can do that on really small levels, then you become super successful and people come back and stay with your brand over and over and over again. And if you can achieve that with your products, you've really, you've really hit a level that very few brands and companies can achieve. We have lots of companies and brands, right, products that we create that go up for a second and come down. It's really hard to build a product that lasts over time and that people feel this engagement with. And when you can do it, then your company can invent time and time again and keep people engaged all the time. This is what all brands and all product companies are striving to do. Whether you have really cool entertainment properties like Disney, or you have mobile apps, or you have physical products, at the end of the day, you're about a relationship with your buyer. Because that relationship is what drives revenue and what keeps people engaged over and over again. I mentioned the Magic Band um, a second ago, um, because this is a project that rolled out at Walt Disney World. And it, you're getting all my Disney experience, so I'll apologize now. Um, but what's really cool about what the Magic Band did is it transformed the park experience. So you know how when you go to the park in California, you have a pass, and then someone runs and gets all the fast passes? Right, and then they bring them all back, and then you're going to go through that line, and then you want to go buy some food, and you whip out your credit card. Well, in Florida, it no longer looks like that. 
In Florida, I put a band on my wrist and it becomes my key to the world. It is my pass to the parks, it's my hotel room, it is my credit card, and it is my fast pass. And it's all tied to a mobile app. And I don't have to carry anything else in the park but a band on my wrist. And what's so cool about that is I now eliminated the decision points that users make when they're in the park, right? I made it frictionless. I made it more immersive for, so that when you're there, your itinerary is planned, your moments are planned, and you just engage as you go throughout the day. And it ends up, for most guests, completely changing the way they experience the park because of all the things you didn't have to worry about and were just taken care of. And it's a really interesting example of a physical world now just being synonymous with, with, with this you know, digital thing on your wrist. Um, and it's a really, if you ever get the chance to go experience it, it's a really cool experience. Um, one of the things I also learned at Disney that goes into my uh, building products is that it's all about guest delight and of course satisfaction. So at Disney, the fastest way to kill a project is to be in a meeting and say that will create guest dissatisfaction. Because as soon as you say that, everyone's like, yeah, that would be a really bad idea, we're not doing that. Because they've gotten a culture so focused on customers that they do everything possible to make those customers happy. And it's not just good enough, it's that every person in their culture is empowered to make a change for a guest. If a guest has a bad experience in a restaurant and they complain, the person you talk to is empowered to make change. They didn't have to go get a supervisor and they didn't have to escalate it. That person can control and turn you around because they recognize that when someone's mad at you about a product or someone has a bad experience, if you can empower the person who they first talked to to actually do something about it, that it changes the entire landscape 90% of the time for the, the thing that that person remembers. All the studies show us that the most negative experience outweighs the most positive. Right? So if you, if you had a great day but one bad experience that you couldn't recover, you will remember that far more than remembering anything else. And this is true time and time in all of our businesses. Whenever there is a negative customer interaction with you or your brand or your employees, it is far remembered than any of the most positive things. And so your mantra should be no matter, and, and sometimes we get so weighed down. I was in a conversation at, in a company that acquired us the other day and we were talking specifically about this because there was cost associated with some of our customer support issues to do guest recovery. And my stance on that is, even if it costs us a little bit, the amount of goodwill that we will get and the, amount, and the opportunity we have to stop someone from spreading that or being frustrated with us is worth the extra cost, even if that one customer is not profitable. And I believe that across the board. And I believe it requires a culture, top to bottom, in your company that appreciates and empowers those people to be able to satisfy your customers. Because when you do that, they like you better, and they come back, and they talk about you. And that's ultimately what our companies need. And obviously, Disney does a really good job about that. And then the fourth thing I want to leave you with on building products, and I know you all have to read Nellet and Skellet, and I'm a complete believer in that philosophy, but I believe that it is a world of test and optimize, not just fail fast, and not just Nellet and then Skellet. So Disney calls them play tests, which I love that word because it's really fun. But I run everything in my businesses and all of my decisions around test and optimize. I promise you, I don't know all the right answers. You do not know all the right answers for your business. But what you can know is really smart ways to attack problems and to set tests and figure out if they work quickly and then move and optimize to the right thing. Um, Steve mentioned the um, Women Tech Council. So this is our core philosophy of the Women Tech Council. We have about 4,000 people in our community today. Uh, we do everything around visibility, you know, opportunity networking, mentoring for women and technology um, across men and women. But we believe in this. So we'll come up with an idea and we'll say, oh, we have this really good plan. Maybe we should go do this talent innovation summit. We don't know if it's a good idea. And then we'll just say, okay, then let's go try it. And if it works, then we'll continue forward and we'll create it as a platform. So find really quick ways to test and optimize your ideas, figure out what works, what didn't work, and then keep going. At Disney, they run full play tests. Every idea that has ever been in that company, they probably have gone to a park or to ESPN, but they have run test after test to figure out what data you get and if it makes sense to then pencil out it and build the pro forma and actually make it happen. And it is a really important philosophy in building great companies and great products because you can't know everything. You can just be smart about the practices that you implement. And for me, this is probably one of the most important things in that stack is that you have to do all of that in context of building platforms that let you quickly test and deliver um, across the board. Um, Sorcerers of the Magic Kingdom is there. 
So I just want to leave you with kind of coming full circle that I believe that it's not just about ideas or innovation because there's a lot of ideas and innovation, but it really comes down to your ability in building product to execute. You have to have good teams and you have to be able to take brilliant ideas and test them in order to go to market. And obviously there's all sorts of important steps inside of there that we could spend hour, other hours talking about. But I will tell you today that if you want to build successful products, it is about your ability to execute and lead a team of people to make it happen. Because otherwise, you won't be able to be successful. You need all of those things to come together to have a chance at being the 5% of companies that will be successful as you go forward. So thank you for letting me come today.